gonna welcome all of you. Thank you for coming here. And it's the first time that the ICRA is in the United States, and we are very excited about it. When you agreed to organize it, we were hoping to have about 150 participants. And uh, it turns out that we have almost 240. So uh, I hope that not too many bad things will happen. <laughs> well, welcome all of you. There are, uh, we're gonna have, if you have any suggestions, let us know. You shouldn't have any problem connecting to Wi-Fi here. There, is, there are instructions on our website how to connect. Uh, <laughs> and I hope your instructions work. <laughs> and you can get to go to our website. Uh, uh, for lunch, right now there is a lot of construction here on campus. And uh, it will become much better during the conference. But uh, the closest place is, well, we have this small cafe here, but it's not going to accommodate 200 of us. Then the Mensa, or the university cafeteria, that's in the Shine Center, and that's relatively close. You have various options there, and then everybody has a piece of paper with lunch options, so that shouldn't be a big problem. All right, so now I'm going to give uh, the mark. Yeah, we decided to Maybe move ahead before the air conditioning breaks down. <laughs> and, uh, so Mark Kleiner is going to be the chair of the first session. It is my pleasure to introduce Robert Marsh of Leeds University, our first workshop speaker. And the title is Dimer Models and Plastic Categories of Wrestling. Okay, thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Maybe that's working now? Yeah. All right, at the back? Okay. The volume can be changed, so please let me know if you can't hear. So I'd like to give an introduction to this topic. So the plan is roughly divided into three according to the three talks. So I'll start by talking about the cluster algebra structure of the Grassmannian. Cluster algebra structure. A beautiful result due to um, uh, Scott. Um, there's also work by Gestman, Shapiro, Einstein, uh, subsequent to that. But I'll be, I'll be following uh, Scott's work 
uh, which is based on Posse curve. So I'll tell you um, right from the beginning what, what a cluster algebra is. Okay, and then secondly, I will talk about the Jensen King Su categorification. So the idea, as with, with all these cluster categorifications, is to model the cluster algebra structure and using, uh, let's say, a triangulated category or a Columbia category. Okay, so, and part three will be work that I've been involved in with, with Bauer and King, and this is where the diamond models come in. Okay, and the, the, what, where do the diamond models come in? They come in when you try to describe the endomorphism algebra of a cluster tilting object. and explain a lot more, but that's a rough summary of what I'm going to do. Okay, so let's start with the Grassmannian itself. Okay, so the Grassmannian is a projective variety, and its elements are k-dimensional subspaces of C to the n. So let's fix natural numbers k less than or equal to n. Okay, and x will be gr kn. Okay, so this is the Grassmannian. of your subspace. Okay, so now, of course there shouldn't be any dependencies amongst those spanning vectors, so it should be a K by N matrix of maximal rank. for your subspace, so we have to have some kind of equivalence to say when we get the same subspace, and that's just change of basis. Okay, so two matrices A and A prime correspond to the same subspace. Okay, so now we have to make this into a projective variety, so we need some functions on the Grassmannian, and these are the Fluker coordinates. So we choose um, a subset of 1 up to n of size k. Okay, so if i a subset of 1n, so I'll use this as shorthand for the set 1 up to n. Okay, and if the cardinality of i is k, then delta sub i of a, okay, this is the minor of a, with rows 1 up to k, and 
columns. Okay, so these are the max or minus of this matrix. Okay, and as a function of the matrix, of course, it's well defined. But as I said, you have this equivalence here. And up to this equivalence, it's not well defined. Okay, but if you change basis, this, all of these Kluge coordinates will change by the same scalar simultaneously. So we have a well defined element of projective space. Okay, so this is called a Kluge coordinate. Okay, and replacing. A with G A scales all Kluge coordinates by the same scalar. So we get a well defined map to projective space. I should stay over here. Till it's done. <laughs> ah, no, it's alright. It's stopped. Okay, so the image, so sorry, this is called the blue curtain bedding. Okay, and the image of this map is a projective variety. are what define it. Okay, and they are known, they are explicitly described. Um, I won't write down all of the Pluca relations, but there are nice ones called the short Pluca relations, which I will write down. They take this form. You take some subset of size uh, k minus 2, and then add two elements to it. You can do that. Okay, so here J is a subset of one n of size K minus two. Okay, uh, disjoint from A B C D. JAB just means J union. B and so on, just a shorthand notation. Okay, and A, B, and C, and D are cyclic in 1 up to N. Okay, so for example, there could be an order going up from 1 up to N, or there could be some rotation of that. 
so this structure can be transferred back to X. So, so if I transfer a structure, X is a projective variety. Okay, and if we have a projective variety, we can consider the affine cone of that variety. And you just take the defining polynomials, the homogeneous defining polynomials, and you regard them as a defining polynomials for an affine variety. Okay, so x hat is the affine cone of x. It's the affine sub variety of C to the KTZ. Oh, sorry. Okay. Defined by the same polynomials. Okay, so it's just the union of the lines that are in the projective variety. genius coordinate ring of the Grassmannian is the coordinate ring of this affine variety by definition. So you have a homogeneous coordinate ring of X. Coordinate ring. Cx hat. Okay, so let me denote it Cx actually. So by definition, it's Cx hat. And it's generated by these delta i's. And then quotient out by the Puncke relation. Last line on the top play, top right blackboard. Ah, uh, okay. X hat is the affine cone of X. This is the affine subvariety of C to the n choose K, defined by the same polynomial. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me all right at the back? Turn, yes. Turn up the volume. Okay. Okay. Good. Functions. So the function field. Okay, we take the function field of x hat. Okay, so this is the field of rational functions. So field of fractions. Of Cx. And this Cx here is an integral domain. And this is a rational function field in k times n minus k plus 1 coordinates, indeterminates. Okay, so it's field of rational functions over C in k times n minus k plus 1 indeterminates. Okay, in the plus 
Plus one comes from the fact that we've, we've taken the yeah, affine cone. Yeah. Okay, so this is the starting point. We have this projected variety, the Grassmannian. Okay, and then Scott's result is that this is a cluster algebra. So now I should tell you about cluster algebras. My, my apologies uh, for those of you who uh, know this all very well. Okay, so these are due to Fomin Zalowinski, 2002. So a cluster algebra is a commutative algebra with a certain combinatorial structure. Okay, so how is this combinatorial structure defined? So fix natural numbers. M and M. Okay, and then we need a field of rational functions. N plus M in determinants. And C will be a subset of M of cardinality M, which is algebraically independent. Okay, and these are the frozen variables. notion of a seed. So a seed in F okay, so called because you start with the seed and it generates the rest of the cluster algebra. It grows into it. So a seed in F is a pair S. First of all we take some subset of F, and secondly, we have a quiver. Ah, right, so now there's a test. Ah, I failed the test. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, this first subset, X union C, is a Regenerating set for F over C. Okay, so you see C is already algebraically independent. Okay, so we can extend it to a free generating set by adding another capital N elements to it. So there will be N plus M elements in this subset. So this is the extended cluster. Okay, so note in particular, these two subsets must have no intersection. Uh, sorry, not, not note in particular, I'm specifying that. So it must be a disjoint union. Okay, so x intersects C is phi. Okay, and x will be called a cluster. Okay, and q is a cluster quiver with vertices x union c. Okay, so the vertices of this quiver are actually elements of the rational function field f. As this is, there are alternative ways to define this, but this works quite well in this context. Okay, so what is a cluster quiver? This is a quiver with no one cycles, no loops, and no two cycles. Okay, so it's just convenient to not have to say that every time. It's quite like this, calling it a cluster quiver.
Okay, so we can then mutate this pair to produce a new seed. And we choose a non-frozen variable, something in the cluster, say little x. So given little x in underline x in the cluster, we can mutate f at x. Okay. You can check that it's again a seed. Okay, and oh yes, so so C is unchanged. Okay, so but X is changed. So we take X and we remove little X and replace it with another element, X prime. Okay, uh, C is unchanged, and we also mutate the quiver Q at X at X. So I have to tell you what x prime is. So x x prime is the product over all the arrows in Q ending at x um, of the labels at the start of those arrows. Okay. Now there might be uh, several arrows from a given y to to x. Okay, and each of those contributes to this product. So in that case, y would appear to some power. Okay, so we want to visit me. And we do the same thing with the arrows starting at x. Okay, so this is with a mutation. So if we have a path of length two which passes through X as its midpoint, we add shortcut going from the start to the end. So this is very representation theoretic. If we were working about computing endomorphism algebras, we had some objects, some, some sometimes A, X, and B, and we deleted X from our list, we would still have the map from A to B. That's, that's what's behind this. Okay, and again, this is with multiplicity. But if you do this, there might have been an array from B to A originally. So you no longer have a cluster quiver. You might have introduced a T cycle. So step B is to remove a maximal set of T cycles. Okay, for this to make sense, you need to be be sure that the arrows in our quiver um, are not actually labelled, because this rule doesn't tell you which particular maximal set of two cycles to delete. But because the arrows are not labelled, it doesn't matter. Okay, and then the final step is to reverse all of the arrows. <coughs> Incident. This is quiver mutation. Okay, so if you're familiar with classical filtering theory, and this final step C is quite familiar, and that's, that's the rule that changes the quiver in classical filtering theory. Um, and let's see. We can use that again. So, in fact, in particular, if, if um, X is a single source, then you're doing the classical move. So that's in BGP and APR tilting. Okay, and the 
Gasmanian will be our example. Oh, this is working. And indeed, the, the Grassmannian case too was the first example that appeared of a cluster algebra. Okay, so we, we repeat this process. Okay, so S is the set of seeds obtained from normal X by arbitrary finite sequences of mutations. So just iterate the procedure. Each time you can choose a different vertex. And if you choose the same vertex twice, you get back to where you started. Yeah. I just want to double check that one. Um, so, for a two-cycle reducing the cycle, this is the explanation. Exactly. So, a two-cycle would look like this. Exactly, just, just delete. Cho choose any two cycle and delete both arrows. And the best is remain. Yes. So what, what could happen is you might have a lot of arrows in a general context, and then you could there's a, a choice there. But if you just repeatedly remove two cycles, you end up with the same thing no matter how you do it. Okay, so this X here is called the initial seed, which generates everything else. Okay, and then it will get a whole load of free generating sets. Okay, and then we take the union of all of those, and these are the cluster variables. Okay, I'm going to exclude the frozen variables from that. Okay, so chi is the union of the clusters. Okay, and then the cluster algebra is the um, commutative ring, which is generated by uh, these elements. So, well, it's the C sub algebra of F generated. C. And this is the cluster algebra. You can see there's a bit of choice here. We need to have chosen C as the underlying field. We could have chosen uh, Q, for example. Okay, and really this, this doesn't depend on which particular free generating set we started with abstractly. Okay, so up to an appropriate notion of isomorphism, which is called strong isomorphism, and cluster algebras too. A S depends only on the choice of quiver. So that's, that's a sort of a quick introduction to cluster algebra. But it, it's also quite common to uh, label the vertices of Q just by 1 up to n plus m rather than the elements of that, which is a more explicit labeling like that.
Um, the, yes, the, um, no, the C is in the extended cluster. Yes, I think that's it. So the cluster is everything except the frozen variables. Okay, so, yes. X alone is the cluster, and X union C is the extended cluster. But again, so some people might call X union C the cluster. Okay, so now I'd like to tell you about the cluster structure on the Grassmannian. This involves some diagrams introduced by Poslikov, called Poslikov diagrams, or alternating strand diagrams. Okay, and I'm going to use some notation introduced by Jensen and King Su, so it's going to be compatible with that later on. So C is a circular graph. So just a cycle. So the vertices pass there down. Okay, and the edges C1. It's another copy of ZN. <laughs> another copy. Okay, and edge I joins I minus one. And I, so say for example. What it is, is a way to encode a seed in the cluster structure on the grass manual. Okay, so it's uh, a planar diagram. So, and it contains n directed curves. Strands in a disk. Marked vertices on its boundary. Corresponding to C1 in clockwise order. Okay, and strand I goes from I to I plus K. Okay, and then the particular axioms that these strands must satisfy. So we have axioms that could be thought of as local. So only two strands can cross at a given point, and all crossings are transverse. many crossing points, you can get some kind of oscillatory thing happening going, going up to infinity. Again, up to now these are sort of quite natural things if you want a combinatorial diagram. The critical axiom is the <coughs> third one, which says 
as you proceed along a strand, the other strands cross in an alternating fashion. So one will come from right to left, and one will come from left to right, and right to left, and so on. So proceeding along a strand, the other strands crossing it. alternate between left to right and right to left. Okay, and there is a, a crossing at the beginning and end of each strand as well. It's not really a crossing, it's just two strands meeting, because another strand will end there. Okay, but that is regarded as a crossing in this sense as well. So, start and end is also regarded as a crossing. Okay, and if, if you draw an example, you can you just extend the strands a little bit beyond the boundary, and you can see what crossing that is. Okay, so they are the local axioms, and then. We also have uh, global axioms. Interesting. And in, in the BKM work, we need it quite uh, substantially. It's very important. Okay, the first one is no self intersections. And, and the second one, okay, so it could be that two strands cross twice. Okay, and if that's true, one strand will be oriented from the first from one crossing point to the other, and the other strand will be oriented back the other way. It's quite hard to state this <laughs> in a clear way, so let's make this attempt. So if two strands cross at U and V, and U is not equal to V, then one strand is oriented from U to V, and the other from V to U. And then when you read that axiom, you're led to think that they are sort of uh, consecutive crossing points, but actually that's not specified. But it doesn't matter. So the, the, the key point is that when two strands cross, it looks like this. Of course, if they, if they crossed again, that would still work. If, you, if this was V, it would still be satisfied. Okay, so the, the place, the orientations next to where, uh, uh, between two places where two strands cross, must be like this. And Scott's effect is this, a lens. Okay, so the lenses must be oriented. Okay, so as is usual with such diagrams, we only consider them up to isotopy. Okay, and the following moves. 
So twisting and untwisting the loops. Okay, so you might have this situation. between two strands. So there's a nice oriented lens here. Okay, um, now there's, there's one thing to make a bit clearer here. In this situation, and this, this, this axiom here must hold, even if there are other strands crossing like that. Okay, so this, we just focus on those two strands and we don't worry about what the rest of the diagram is doing. Could be crossing over it. Okay, but in this twisting and untwisting move, This is a local operation. There can't be any other strands inside that disk, which is within the big disk. Okay, so it's a local move. Okay, and if you look at that, you can, if you pulled it tight, you would get this. They would get un entangled. Okay, and the move says, okay, so the isotopy doesn't allow that. So we additionally add it in. We have this topological man maneuver here. Okay, and you could go in either direction. You could introduce the complication if you wished. And there are contexts in which that, that would be useful. And the, the, the other move is doing the same thing at the boundary. It might be quite fun to consider sort of braid versions of these where there's over and under crossing. As far as I know, they haven't been considered. Okay, so here, it's more like the symmetric group. We don't care which of those strands go over or under the level. So I think time-wise there is time to attempt to draw an example. So I've tried to choose an example which, if you, if you want to copy it down, will be possible. <laughs> so it's, it's a very regular example. So often they look much more irregular than this, but it's quite nice to see a very regular one. And in fact, these regular ones came up in some joint work with Constance of each on the mirror symmetry for the glass manual. Um, so this is GR36. So I start with hexagon. So in order to make it sort of reasonably easy to draw, it's going to be drawn in a more piecewise linear fashion. 
because really they ought to be nice and smooth. Right? Okay, so draw a triangle on each edge of the hexagon. Okay, and then choose two adjacent triangles and draw a rhombus. And then do that for the other two pairs of adjacent triangles. And then, on the two outer edges of each rhombus, draw a triangle. And in fact, that, that is the diagram I've just got to orient. See there are six boundary points. Okay, let's number them. One, two, three, four. Ah, <laughs> what happened there? Sorry, I missed the note. <laughs> Prerequisite to get the utopian is being happened. Six. Again, we, we just choo choose an orientation of a triangle, and that actually will determine the rest of the orientations. So let's orient this triangle, say, anti clockwise. And okay. um, then this, because at this crossing point here, this must be a strand, uh, and this one crosses it. So that tells us how to orient the next two as well. Okay. And every triangle turns out to be oriented. Now you see here at this point it's a bit strange because actually this strand here comes round this way. So we do lose something in having this very regular picture because it's hard to see what the strands are actually doing. Okay, this strand is actually coming round. Okay. So every triangle will be oriented one way or the other, clockwise or anti-clockwise. And the rhombi will not be oriented, they will be alternating in orientation. what I should write down next. Yes, yeah, so the diagram, we get regions of three kinds. Oriented clockwise. Oriented anti-clockwise. They say the triangles are oriented regions and the rhombi and the hexagon Okay, you have to be a bit more careful with the Boundary regions. Okay, so of course there is an issue with the boundary because the boundary hasn't been oriented. But you just look at the rest of the boundary of that region. And in fact, the boundary regions are alternating as well. Okay, so. 
We then have to draw the quiver. Say, Sorry. Yes. Uh, is it true that every uh, every oriented part would be always a triangle, or it would be a bigger polygon? Uh, okay. Yeah. So the question is, is, is every oriented part always a triangle, um, or could it be bigger? It could it could be bigger. Okay. So yes, in this case. general the boundary regions will always be alternating, but I think I need to double check that actually. Okay, so we then label the alternating regions. Oh yeah, so it, it's true, the boundary regions are always alternating. So label the alternating regions. Strands passing to the right. Okay, so if you look at strand one, um, it passes to the right of all of these regions down here. Strand, strand one does the And at four, so all of these regions down here get a one. Okay. If you'd like, it's easier to think of the strand and then label all the regions to its left. They all get the label of that strand. Yes. That's a, that's a path in the graph. If you think of this as a graph, an oriented, a digraph, that would be a path. But the idea, this is a Kostnikov diagram in the sense that they defined it. So this, at, at this point, two strands cross. A strand that started at one crosses another strand. Well, so the, the in, crossings must always be transverse. So. I think it's hard to see which, which one they're saying. So you should wiggle them a little bit. So can, yeah, this is, this is, yeah I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is why can't I choose my strands Ah, because it wouldn't be transverse, that's one way to see it. So this strand comes here, goes along, it would, it would only tangentially touch this. Oh, okay. oh the other side would be tangentially. So the choice of the six paths is part of the data. So you could choose different paths, but then you have to go back. Even if it was truly ambiguous. No, I mean, the, the diagram consists of six chosen strands. So. Yes, that's, that's a good way to put it. So, I sort of explained how you could start with some kind of tiling and then create a diagram out of it. Okay. Um, but I'm not giving you a general rule for converting a tiling into a diagram. I'm just using this tiling as a way right, to give an example of a diagram. I think if, if your tiling has these kind of probably have to have all, always these kind of crossings and then it will be clear that it must always go over. But it's probably quite an interesting question how tilings give rise to these things. Generally, you'd have to think about them. So yeah, as Matt said, the, the, the diagram itself has the data of strands. So this strand is specified to be this. That's another way around. OK, so I should finish this labeling. Okay, we might be. We have 
right to the end, is that right? I could, I could come to an end quite soon, is that? I that's fine. Ah, just two or three maybe. Okay, so, um, okay, so these will be three subsets of one up to six. These are the Fluker coordinates in the cluster, in the extended cluster. Okay, and so the last thing I need to do is tell you what the quiver is. So, the rule for drawing the quiver. So, at any crossing point, you will have a picture like this, where the two strands cross. And there's a natural way to draw an arrow across that crossing. Okay, so if, if two alternating regions are adjacent, if they have a point of intersection, we draw a corresponding arrow, and we follow the flow of the, of the strands in the diagram. cycles in the quiver. Okay, so I've drawn all the arrows then I think. Okay, so this is uh, this is what you need for the cluster algebra structure. This is this is Scott's quiver. I mean from this Bosnikov diagram. Okay, but we are also going to have some arrows around the boundary. So these, are, these, these outer Fluker coordinates will be frozen variables, so there shouldn't be any arrows between them. And that's, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that. Okay, so, but later on we will need them. So I'm going to draw them in. So if you take this collection of Fluker coordinates without the boundary arrows, you get a, a, a quiver, which is actually a seed um, in the Grassmannian, and generates its cluster algebra structure. Okay, so the seed consists of these Fluker coordinates and the quiver without the boundary arrows. That's the pair. Okay, so next time I'll write that down more explicitly. I wanted to show you the example of how this comes out. Morphism of the uh, ambient field, this field of rational functions, from one, from one ambient field to the other. And it should take a seed in one cluster of field to a seed in the second one. And it's in um, cluster of field to Fogan and Dalevinsky's paper. They write this definition down. Okay, in fact, if it takes one seed in one cluster of it, it must take all the seeds in the first to all the seeds in the second. Um, why is it GR36? What is the, yeah. Why is it 3 and 6? Yeah. Okay, so um, so the 6 is the number of vertices around the boundary. Mm -hmm. so that would be N in general. Okay, and the 3, so strand I starts at I, ends at I plus K. Yeah. So here you can see strand 1 starts at 1 and ends at 4, this one that comes through. So 2 will two end at 5, 3 end at 6, 4 ends at 1, and so on. So I goes to I plus K in general. Your arrows are 
I think it's this quite, there is always this question, what, what do you really want to do at the boundary? Um, but the way I set things up, we could actually apply a boundary um, uh, twisting. <coughs> that would actually reverse this array. It would actually create an extra array uh, going around like that. I'm, I'm going to say something, and of course that would then be a two-cycle so, um, I've got to say something about two cycles next time. Okay, but the way I set it up, there is flexibility on the boundary, so the arrows could, mm, the, the direction of the arrow is not determined. But in, in, in uh, Scott's paper, I think Scott is uh, more definite about what these triangles on the boundary must be. Um, but the way I set things up, it could be the way around. So yes, I, I've introduced this two cycles, I should say, <laughs> because these are twisting and untwisting rules could introduce two cycles. So a reduced diagram would be one where, where there aren't any. You, you could always untwist and get rid of the two cycles. Other questions?